Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mike Hecht, who is Associate Research Director for the Haystack Observatory at MIT and is the principal investigator for the MOXIE uh, uh, project. And he's gonna tell us about challenges and opportunities for oxygen generation. And uh, Mike did his uh, uh, tour of duty academically uh, through uh, Princeton is an undergraduate, MIT has a master's and then PhD at Stanford before settling here for a number of years at Caltech where I interacted with Mike about 15 years ago on planetary instrument development uh, before he headed back to the East Coast. Uh, and of course we know that uh, exploration uh, is challenging and Mike, uh, uh, upon traveling here to Pasadena, uh, to, to sort of uh, encapsulate and crystallize the challenges associated with our workshop um, was uh, found that he was missing his uh, charger for his laptop. As we know, mission power is a big challenge for uh, uh, all of us. <clears throat> and so he did the uh, normal thing, which is to go to the uh, Apple store in Burbank and uh, seek out a charger. Uh, while he was in the store uh, getting the charger for his laptop, somebody broke into his car and stole the laptop. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so that illustrates the other aspect about our workshop, which is that planetary exploration is itself very challenging, uh, not only on Mars, but in this case on Earth in the vicinity of the uh, San Fernando Valley. So, uh, <clears throat> and with that, no further ado, I'll give the floor to Mike. Well, thank you, Harry. So indeed, indeed, these things, these things, if people haven't seen them in a long time, these are called notes, and they're what you use if you want to give a talk with no slides, right? <laughs> I still remember how to do this, so. Um, one of your older presentations. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> let's, let's stay the course. So this is my, my worldly possessions I have with me, and uh, you know, the bag from the charger, and you'll be happy to know that the store took the charger back, uh, I, and so instead of being out 80 bucks, I was only out 40 bucks for the phone charger, which I lost because it was in the computer bag. So, um, okay, enough of that story. Uh, so, next page of notes. Well, you heard about Mars. <laughs> the, uh, one of the people on the MOXIE team, Don Rapp, was doing a review of plans to go to Mars, and he did a count of plans out in the in the literature, and he stopped at about 1,000. So one of the reasons I'm speaking, uh, when Jerry covered you know, the ISRU terrain so ex excellently, and we heard from Dave about Mars, is simply because there are more opinions in this business than there are practitioners in the business. So maybe you'll hear a little bit of that, of that diversity. Um, the basic scheme for getting to Mars, based on, say, the design reference architecture, which you probably would have to consider the gold standard, or at least from NASA's point of view. If you go online and find DRA 5.0, that's as close as there comes to be an official NASA plan for getting people to Mars. And the basic idea is you go every 26 months, as you know, as most of you know, you know Mars right now is really bright in the sky, and it will be bright again 26 months from now, and that usually means a spacecraft is on its way to Mars. And, and everyone at JPL is very happy when Mars is bright in the sky because a spacecraft's on the way. So we do, we do respond to astrology. When Mars is in some house or other, life is good. Life is good. So every 26 months, you get a chance. And then if you want to do human exploration, you can start counting back from when you want to go to what you have to learn. And then you count forward to say, when can I resupply? When can I send the second crew? When can I send the third crew? Basic idea is the first slot, you send a habitat, you send um, an ascent vehicle so the crew, you know, unlike Mars One, the crew can actually leave the planet and come home. Uh, I assume, how many of you here would go to Mars if you had the chance? All right, about half, that's typical. How many of you raised your hands would also like to come back? <laughs> okay, there we go, all right, thank you, thank you. So if you, so the habitat uh, goes, the MAV, the ascent vehicle goes, and thank you to the Martian for making things like MAV everyday terminology so people know what I'm talking about. And you send a power plant, and let's assume, as the DRA does, that this is a nuclear reactor. Uh, obviously, that's politically fraught, but they've been flown for decades. So there's nothing, you know, the technology is not, 
you know, then a miracle occurs. So you have a reactor. We can argue whether it's 25 kilowatts, or, which is closer to the DRA, or whether it's 50 kilowatts, which is more like the evolvable Mars result, somewhere in there. And the low-hanging fruit here, in terms of ISRU, you know, is, turns out to be oxygen. So let me explain that briefly. Um, the idea is you have a lot of mass you have to get to Mars. You have many, many, many metric tons. There's a gear ratio, as Jerry alluded to, of you know, 11 to 1, 12 to 1, for how much mass you have to put in orbit, you know, 11 kilograms to, to Earth orbit, low Earth orbit, to get you know, a kilogram to the surface of Mars. So everything multiplies, everything mushrooms. And what you want to do to, to uh, make this mission as easy as possible is take the time from landing all that stuff on Mars, the clock is ticking, and in, you know, from the time you launched, 20, 26 months later, that's when you hope to have human astronauts launching. So by the time you land, you've got about 12, 13, 14 months to work with. And in that time, you can do lots of things to get prepared, including converting resources, all right? So what resources are worth converting? The low-hanging fruit is oxygen because it's the single biggest, it's about 27 metric tons of oxygen you need for that MAV. It's the single biggest chunk of stuff that you have to bring to Mars to get the astronauts back to orbit. If you can make it there, you save an awful, if you can make it anywhere, if you can make it there, <laughs> you save an awful lot of, <laughs> of, of, of lift mass. Um, right, that's right. I'm not singing it, no. <laughs> All right, so back to ISRU then. Um, when I first started getting involved in this project, I, I was arguing it shouldn't be called ISRU. We utilize in situ resources all the time. We utilize it every time we pop a parachute on Mars. We're using, we're using resources. Heck, someone pointed out recently, which is great, when we go to, to orbit and we're using the vacuum of space, for example, for manufacturing, that's a really cool in situ resource because nothing turns out to be one of the most valuable resources we have on the planet Earth. It's really hard to make nothing on Earth. We have big vacuum systems to do it. It's a great in situ resource. What's important about what we're talking about here is in situ resource transformation. Okay, we're taking something, we're taking air, we're taking water, we're turning it into something else. And that's really the key, and that's what this workshop's about. So, so I'm not saying change the acronym, but focus on this piece of ISRU where you're changing something. Now, I would argue then that, that the obvious thing to do is to make oxygen from CO2 just as if you were a tree, right? Trees have the benefit of having water available, but you don't need water available. So I'll tell you a little bit about MOXIE. The idea of MOXIE is to show you can do this, that you can save that 27 metric tons by sending about a ton of stuff to Mars to take its place. That's a ratio of you know, roughly 27 to 1, obviously, in what you make versus what you have to bring to do that one job. Um, when we burn, so when we combust something on Earth, when we drive our car, when we put a log in our fireplace, the vast majority of what we're combusting is not the log, it's not the gasoline. By mass, it's the oxygen. That's why this is a big issue. Fuel, yeah, there's fuel, but you know, if you're burning hydrogen and oxygen, the oxygen is 78%, or I guess that's methane and oxygen, it's the oxygen 78%. So that's the big chunk. So how do you make oxygen? Well, it turns out there's a good deal of art in doing this uh, in the solid oxide, with the solid oxide approach, not because there's a tremendous demand to turn CO2 into oxygen on Earth. That would be kind of stupid since we have a very teeny tiny bit of CO2 in our atmosphere and lots of oxygen. You might want to do that maybe to scrub, you know, uh, to scrub uh, emissions from factories, but normally the oxygen is the waste product on Earth. Okay, so what we want to do is really novel. We want to start with CO2 and, to, and save the oxygen, which is the waste product. So why is there art? The reason there are, there's art is very simple. Okay, so here's what we do. You start with CO2, and you start with electricity, and you get out oxygen and CO. Now suppose you do the opposite. You start with oxygen and CO. You put it into this system, change, you know, switch the wires. What you get out is is um, CO2 and electricity, and that's called a fuel cell, okay? That's why there is an art, because there is an art in fuel cells to produce, to take, not necessarily CO, but you can start with CO, but start with a, 
fuel and with oxygen produce a, a, by, uh, a byproduct that's stable like CO2 or H2O and get electricity out. So, on, so really, if you look at the structure of what we're building, it's very similar. So what's the idea? Why are we doing this? Why are we sending MOXIE? Well, <laughs> this story really started back in the 1990s, actually. You know, I remember, I remember it very well. Um, uh, you know, when, the, when an AO came out, an announcement of opportunity came out for the 2001 lander, which most of you have never heard of. I mean, Lou, you remember it, but <laughs> because it never flew. But it was, a, it was an absolute milestone in the program of Humans to Mars because for some reason, just for some anomaly, some time warp opened up, and the Human Exploration Organization, which was then called HEADS, Human Exploration and Development of Space, said, this is the time to start thinking that opportunity ahead, that opportunity ahead, that opportunity ahead. And we have to do three or four things. We have to understand the radiation environment. We have to understand why, how dust and soil creates a toxic hazard to astronauts. Now, that may sound a little weird. Dust doesn't seem dangerous to us. You know, it's just kind of annoying. Um, but on the moon, it was very dangerous. And so concern was that it would be dangerous on Mars. And we have to learn how to make oxygen out of CO2. And there was some other, you know, high lift to drag vehicles, you know, the some entry descent landing issues. Those were the four. So the 2001 mission was supposed to address all of those, in addition to doing grand science. That grand science ultimately became MER, the, Mar the Mars Exploration Rovers. But for a short period of time, there was an opportunity to compete, to build, to start the journey of humans to Mars. Um, the mission was canceled to fast forward when Polar Lander crashed because it was the twin to Polar Lander and NASA said, we don't want to look really foolish by sending its twin to Mars and losing that one too. So they put it aside, they put it in a big crate, literally, it was guarded by top men, right? And it was pulled out, it was pulled out of storage um, uh, uh, for, and became the Phoenix Lander eventually. And my role in this, I was the PI for the, um, the dust analysis, which was called MECA, which flew on Phoenix. Also in 2001, and Jerry was involved in this, was an instrument called MIP, the Mars in Situ Propellant Production Prototype. So it was a nice embedded acronym. ISPP at the time, which is now called ISRU, uh, embedded in, in, in the word MIP. And it used a solid oxide electrolysis cell much of the same technology, it used sorption to collect the, to collect the CO2. Um, and that one was never replaced until now. So finally, after what, 15 years, finally, with the space station kind of under control, if not done, the next generation of space human exploration really, you know, in, in the horizon, you know, uh, the, uh, it was time to go back to work and do what we started doing. So an AO came out associated with the 2020 Mars lander, which is itself more or less a clone of the Curiosity lander. An opportunity presented itself to get back onto that program, and the first thing to do was the one piece that had not yet been done, which was MIP, to bring back the Mars in situ propellant production prototype uh, experiment. And so in homage to that, a group of us put together a team and we propose MOXIE, and the reason I say homage is because it also has the embedded acronym, the I in MOXIE is for in ISRU, okay? So it's the Mars Oxygen ISRU experiment that was very intentional. Um, so who is this us? I'll mention myself and the deputy PI. I love saying the deputy PI for Jeff Hoffman because he was my professor back when I was in graduate school at MIT a long time ago. And I went off and did Mars missions at JPL. Jeff went off and uh, flew on the space shuttle five times, and we both ended up back in MIT after long careers with different, the different ends of NASA, the different ends of the galaxy. And we came back and thought, what a great combination to look at the beginnings of human exploration with a prototype experiment. Now, if we could, it would not be a whole lot harder for us to build right now, today, a sort of one meter squared full-size oxygen production plant that would produce all the oxygen you would need for, um, to fill up the fuel tank on this MAV to get you guys back into orbit once you land on Mars in 2035. Um, but we don't have the ability to send that to Mars. We don't have the power to 
to fuel it on Mars. Given that we want to try this out before you guys actually go, the next best thing was to build something this big uh, that you know, kind of fits in what used to be called a bread box. I don't think we have those anymore. <laughs> and the size was really limited because we're inside the belly of this rover, so it really can't grow. There's nowhere to grow. The mass has grown, but the size hasn't. Okay, so we have this opportunity. We have a little wimpy RTG, a radioisotope thermoelectric generator on Mars 2020. We're sharing it with six other instruments. So we can't just turn this thing on and generate oxygen for a long time, but we are, you know, promise we'll get maybe 15 opportunities once every month or once every two months to use all the power available that's been stored up in the batteries for the day and produce oxygen for an hour or two. So that's what MOXIE will do. And why are we doing it? Um, I'd say there's a few major reasons. One is, Jerry alluded to this, the devil is in the details. So there's been lots of work on how to build these solid oxide fuel cells, um, or these solid oxide electrolysis cells. There's been lots of work on components. When you put the whole system together, you end up saying, oh crap, you know, this doesn't work as a system, or here's what's limiting it. So that's one reason. Obviously, to get the experience of running it on Mars and learn about things like control algorithms and systems, to get a sense of the overall system performance. Um, it's partly an opportunity to build a full-scale system to test in the laboratory. Now, one could do that without going to Mars. In practice, I mean, in principle, in practice, no, because you don't have the resources. To, do you ever have the resources to do that and test it in the lab yeah, under the NASA? No, exactly. So we now have the resources to get a flight spare, which will be incredibly valuable. So opportunity to learn, to gain knowledge, to gain confidence, and to gain heritage, which is huge. Because now all we have to do is make it bigger, which in some ways turns out to be easier than making it smaller. Okay, so, so what, what all is involved and what have we learned? Well. First thing you have to do, this was alluded to, is you have to collect all that air that you want to convert to oxygen. That turns out to be hard. Uh, there's different ways of doing it. Uh, you can do it, a lot of people have looked at doing it cryogenically, so you freeze it down onto a cold head and then you close a valve and you warm it up and you blow it off to go somewhere else. That turns out to be kind of energy intensive and complicated. Um, from a system perspective, since eventually when we really do this for humans, we're going to have a big cryogenic system to cryogenically store the oxygen, it might make more sense. For MOXIE, it makes sense to do what all of us, you know, lab rats that worked in vacuum systems for years, uh, <laughs> you know, well, um, you do in the laboratory, you have a mechanical roughing pump that goes chugga, chugga, chugga and pumps the air down. Why do you need to compress it? Well, it turns out you might as well. Uh, it's much more difficult to de design a flow-through system that puts an enormous amount of air over a, rel of a very small electrolysis system. It's not really any harder to compress it. It turns out the hard part, one of the things we've learned, is actually sucking it through a filter. Okay, this was a surprise to all of us. It was certainly a big surprise to me. Some of us still don't quite believe it, which is why we're doing tests in Denmark in about two weeks to see if this is really right. But it turns out if you take your you know, garden variety HEPA filter, and if you measure the, you know, if you flow air at it at about, it's, this is big for this MOXIE system, you flow air at it for about, you know, four or five centimeters a second, pretty slow, you get a pressure drop across it on Earth that might be a few tor. That does not scale with pressure, meaning if you try to do it on Mars, it's still a few tor, which is half the pressure you have to work with to begin with. You throw a tiny, tiny bit of dust at it, maybe average of a micron, you know, a gram per meter squared, that few tor becomes six or seven tor, and suddenly you're not, you know, you're, you're not sucking anything through. So that's one of the system lessons we learned, is don't take filtering for granted if you have to move a lot of air at low pressure. It's different on Mars. That's the kind of thing we're hoping to learn. Okay, the next stage is the SOXI, the solid oxide electrolysis system. I said this has been done on Earth. What's the problem? The problem is that it's just not typically done dry, for one thing. To begin with, CO2 to CO and oxygen is exotic. So yeah, this looks kind of the same if you look at it, but when you get into the details of the films and the coatings and the catalysts and whatnot, it's different. And then doing it without water is different. The other thing that turns out to be different is a Mars 2020 wrinkle. 
Usually, you know, somewhere right behind the Athenaeum, there's a big bank of, 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 there's a big plant of fuel cells from Bloom Energy, right? And that's full of these things. They look just like what we're flying. Um, but, um, you know, and those are, of course, going in the other direction as fuel cells. But when you add these complexities of having to do a dry, of having to do it in this particular system, things get a little bit squirrely. And that's what we're dealing with. Those systems, when they turn on, they stay on. Okay, they stay on. With Mars 2020, we have to run it for an hour and shut it off. It runs at 800 degrees C. You cool it down to zero or below. You turn it on and heat it up again. I think if you did that to that fuel cell bank out back, it wouldn't be very happy. So in the end, what do we spend our time doing? Learning how to turn it off and turn it on again without losing performance. Okay. Uh, the other part of the system we have to is uh, lots and lots of sensors to figure out what we're getting out, since in the end, we're letting this stuff go, and it's a shame. I, I'd love to take the CO and the O2 and light a little torch and have the first flame on Mars in four billion years. That's my fantasy. <laughs> but we're just, it's just letting it go, which is a shame. But we do have to characterize it before we do that, show that it's pure, understand the performance, understand the performance in Mars and the presence of environments, all the things that Dave described, the pressure going up and down, the temperature going up and down. So the other lesson I want to talk about we've learned and then make a couple of comments about um, ISRU in general and kind of system level trades, I'll need to check my notes again on that, um, you know, is, is to uh, look at what limits the system performance. That's one of the big things we learn. Everyone, of course, at the beginning said we've got to get the, the, the SOXI, the solid oxide electrolysis system performance up under these bizarre circumstances. It's all measured in terms of really one quantity or two quantities one that's important, the area-specific resistance. Why is that? It's Ohm's law. Um, so you put in a certain current. Each, each, each four electrons gives you an oxygen molecule. Um, and you, you basically crack the CO2. You form CO and O minus minus. The O minus minus is drawn through these 800 degrees C ceramic membranes out the other side, out its own manifold. Uh, so if you measure, simply measure the current, you learn the amount of oxygen you created. That's totally straightforward as long as, and then to get the rest of the system performance, you have a certain applied voltage. It has to be kept very low so that you don't start forming carbon, which would gunk up the works. Uh, amusingly, that's called coke, and the instrument's called moxie. And way back in the 20s, coke and moxie were, used to be the big competing soft drinks. But coke won then. Moxie's going to win now. Okay. <laughs> um, so you have to have a certain voltage. Voltage, current, and what's left in Ohm's law is resistance. And that's the intrinsic resistance of these, of these materials as a function of area. It's called the area-specific resistance. If you know that, and you know the open circuit voltage, which is pretty well constant, about 0 .8, 0 0.8 volts, you can then solve the whole problem. And you know that one number, you know how much oxygen you'll, you'll produce. So keeping the ASR low, this is golf, low is good, um, was one of the challenges. That's been resolved. We can produce plenty of oxygen uh, numbers probably approaching 20 grams per hour with our existing system, which is about how much you would actually use sitting here in this room dozing off. Okay, that's about, you consume about 20 grams per hour. So just to give you a metric. We will need for, to fill up that tank so you can come back to Mars, we'll need something like two or three kilograms an hour. So a couple of orders and two orders of magnitude and change scale up from there. So, okay, so. That's fine. What else is limiting it? Well, it turns out you need power supplies to produce that current. It turns out we can only produce four amps with our power supply. So that's the next limiting factor. So that knocks us down to about no more than 12 grams per hour. So all this worry about the SOXI, we can't even exercise it to its fullest with the power supply. We could do a bigger one, but we don't have room for it. Uh, well, that kind of was annoying until it turned out that the pump was rated to produce, pl to produce plenty of CO2 to deliver to the SOXI. You can't use all of it because you'd risk coke again. So assuming a 50, 60% utilization, we had thought we had plenty, and then we looked at the landing sites. This comes back to Dave's talk. And you know, in the past, the landers have always gone to really low elevation because that's easy to land. And the science community was told for, for March 2020, we could land higher. Okay, the engineering has improved. So they said, oh good, let's do that. So all the landing sites are high elevation and the pressure, instead of being at kind of seven-ish tor like that Viking picture, uh, is down at about four tor. 
So we have half the, half the air we thought we were going to have to work with. So suddenly now the air supply and the pumping is our limiting factor. Okay, so, and then it turns out we're in the belly of this rover and it's kind of warm and if we use too much energy, making too much oxygen, we'll have to shut down because moxie will get too hot. So we're thermally limited. Yeah, system level, there's a lot of things that limit. So that's one of the big lessons learned. And I probably left one out. That's why I'm checking these notes. This is when I'm supposed to drop them on the floor. Right? Um, yeah, the temperature, of course, counts. Oh, and of course, the dust is, you know, the dust in the filter now is probably going to be our limiting factor. OK, so just let me make a couple of other comments about some of the numbers floating around here that I don't entirely um, subscribe to. I think one of the things you need to do when you're exploring Mars, and I don't care whether this is the kind of experiments Dave is talking about, purely science or humans, is you have to think like a Martian. You have to shed yourself of your terrestrial prejudices. I remember one of the things I've always thought would be a really good thing to do would be to land on the North Pole of Mars. And the immediate reaction to that from the engineers is, but it's really cold there. Well, you know, it turns out when we say cold, that this room is cold, it's because we're bathed in this blanket of air that really is good at, con at, at transmitting, transferring the temperature of the environment to us. When you're in Mars, it's more like being in space in some respects. Is space cold? No, usually you have to air condition spacesuits. We generate plenty of heat internally to keep warm. That's kind of true on Mars, not quite. So cold, not an issue. What's really an issue if you were standing on the North Pole is you would have only one thermal cycle a year. Okay? Thermal cycles are huge. Temperature is not. So think like a Martian. You say, what's the most benign thermal environment on the planet? Probably the North Pole. South is a, has other problems, but North is good. Um, I like the North Pole because I'm really interested in a science experiment of, of drilling down with thermally, melting ice you know, for the two or three kilometers, and reconstructing the climate history. It's all there in the ice. You want water? What better place to get water <laughs> to make fuel? Um, you want radiation shielding? You take a chainsaw and you cut up blocks of ice and make an igloo and you've got radiation shielding. So you got to think like that. It's important. Um, and for the same reason, Jerry made a comment I guess I'll take small issue with. It's probably right, but I disagree with the reason. And that's CO, whether you might want to just use your CO and oxygen as a fuel. Because I would argue, first of all, that we are the customer. ULA is not the customer. This is a one-off, get from the ground to orbit. I agree the ISP is really low. But from the system level trade, OK, the alternative is we bring seven or eight metric tons of hydrogen-containing fuel with us. Or we travel, we drive three or four rovers 25,000 kilometers to recover enough soil to squeeze out enough water to make more fuel, or we go somewhere we don't want to go, uh, where there happens to be water. So I say you do the system trade and say, maybe CO2 is the way to go despite all its liabilities when you put all the system factors in the equation. And the point, coming back to the original point, yes, we're not, we're not the customers because we're thinking like Earthlings. If you're thinking like Martians, we'd probably be flying all our rockets on CO, CO2 because it's easy and it's available. Uh, maybe. Okay, so, so that's kind of the system message. Um, the other system message I want to convey, or maybe two more quickly, and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, one has to do with some of these numbers that you've seen about you know, ratios of this or ratios of that. And I think the only way to stay sane looking at all those numbers, you know, I, I, an example I give, I could say, what's the ratio with and without MOXIE for the amount of, hydro, amount of oxygen you make on the surface to the amount you bring? Well, it's infinite. You know, so you kind of have a range of, of ratio numbers you can come up with. In my mind, these are trade studies. Every aspect of this is a trade study. Whether you land on the North Pole or the equator, whether you make oxygen or whether you prospect for water. I argue that making oxygen from CO2 is truly low-hanging fruit because you can do it anywhere. You don't have to prospect. You're not constraining the mission. You stand there, you breathe in, you breathe out. You have oxygen. Um, 27 metric tons without, one metric ton with. To add, from the numbers Jerry presented, to add water to that, 
You have to prospect, you have to go to a certain place, you have to carry rovers, you have to spend a lot of time doing stuff. In that case, you have 0.7 metric tons investment to save seven metric tons. So, you know, saving this much, oxygen saving this much. As trade studies, I would argue that the oxygen, let me be modest about it and say the oxygen is obviously first. You have to think really hard about whether you, it's worth taking that second step, which then becomes a big trade study involving things like, why don't we just land where the water is to begin with? Okay, so that's, that's the, that point. And finally, I just want to make one acknowledgement to the work down out of, some out of JPL, out of uh, Bob Schiss, uh, out of uh, Ollie Dweck's group at, at MIT, where people are starting to do the trade study across the whole solar system. I think Ollie's work is particularly nice. We're saying, okay, you know, Jerry alluded to the fact fuel tanks are never empty and they're never full. You put fuel depots around the solar system. You do you lunar ISRU, you do asteroid ISRU, you have space tugs going back and forth that never land. Put all these things in the equation and then do the logistics optimization. And you come up with some really wild answers for how to do this efficiently, cost effectively, at the cost of complexity. You know, and it may push the time off when we do it by years. So the trades, the trade studies, you know, that's absolutely important. And I think I'm probably running out of time. I haven't been watching. I have a minute, perfect. A minute is perfect because in the minute I want to acknowledge, I already acknowledged Jeff Hoffman, but I want to acknowledge my whole team, which is inter international, includes Jerry. And in particular though, all the folks up the hill at JPL, I see you know, Gerald Vex sitting, uh, Vex sitting back here, who are doing a phenomenal job taking what's essentially kind of you know, view graphs and components and turning it into a flight instrument. And it's just astonishing to see this thing take shape and it's gonna be real and it's gonna work. And yeah, I'm the one that gets to stand up and talk about it. But those guys led by Jeff Milstrom up the hill are the guys building it and they deserve all the credit. So thank you.